The next operator family we're going to look at are chops. And chops are extremely useful because they're going to be how we control the networks we're making. As you saw in the last example, tops are our 2D textures, but without any kind of chops to actually control them and make them dynamic, things can get really boring really quickly. So we want to make something that's not boring, so we need chops, plain and simple. So in this example that we're going to make, we're going to use just a really simple top network, which is going to do a little bit of compositing of a circle on top of a bigger background. And then we're going to use chops to get some information from the mouse, process that information a little bit, and use it to dynamically move that kind of circle that we're drawing on the background and affect it in different ways. So let's get started. The first thing we're going to do is I'm going to go to the tops. I'm going to make a circle top. And then similarly to what we did before, I'm going to make a constant top, which is going to serve as our background. And I'll do what I did previously, which was zero out all the channels and then set the alpha to zero as well. So it's just black. And then I'll go to the common page and I'll set this to 1920 by 1080. And then I'm just going to do a simple over just like we did before. The background is going to go to the second input. Circle is going to go to the first input. And then I'm going to change the pre fit overlay to be native res. I'm going to put a null after this. And then I'll just draw the null in the background using the display flag we talked about. And then the one final thing I want to add to this is in between my circle and my over, I'm actually going to add a level top so I can control a little bit of the processing of the circle, maybe dim the opacity whenever we click the mouse. And like we said, a quick and easy way to do that is to right click on the wire when it's selected, click insert, in this case, we'll grab a level top and drop it in the middle. And then I'll just clean up this network a little bit so it looks a little more neat. Great, so now we're ready to start digging into chops. And like we said before, chops are all kinds of control data, whether we're talking about OSC, whether we're talking about ArtNet or DMX, or whether we're talking about uh, inputs like, you know, whether connect cameras, uh, the mouse, joysticks, tablets, all these things create chop data for us. So let's get started with the, with something really easy. Let's go to the chop family here at the top and we'll get started with a mouse in chop. And the mouse in chop basically gives us data about the position of the mouse and we can get some other data like the left, right, and middle buttons as well as the wheel. For our simple example, what we're gonna do is we're gonna start with the TX and TY position and we're gonna add the left mouse button. So what I have to do is you can see TX and TY are already written in the position X and position Y parameters to unmask and basically activate any one of these other channels. We just have to give it a name. So for my left button, what I can do is click in that parameter, type click, and now you can see I have my TX, which decreases and goes to negative one when I'm on the left edge of the screen, positive one on the right side. TY similar is going to actually be negative or positive 0.5 when I go upwards and negative 0.5 at the bottom, what I'm going to do is change my output coordinates because I want those two to be the same. I don't like them to be normalized by aspect ratio. It makes scaling them a little bit more uh, labor intensive because we have to scale them differently. I'm going to switch the output coordinates to normalized. And this way, when I take my mouse to the top of the screen, it's at one, bottom is negative one, left side is negative one, right side is positive one. And then you can see we have a click channel. So if I click, that becomes one. And as I'm holding down still, it's still a one. And when I release, it goes back to zero. So this will give us enough data to start playing around with chops. And importantly, more importantly, I should say, is we're gonna start doing something called referencing channels to kind of control parameters. So let's start with the basic. Let's, let's take our TX and TY position and we wanna separate it from our click because we're gonna process these two different data points differently. So what I'm gonna do is use something called a select chop. And select chop is very useful because what it does is it allows you to take a subset of information from a chop that maybe has a lot of channels and then basically just process them however you want separately. So in this case, I wanna take my TX and TY and ignore my click channel for now. So I can go to the channel names parameter. Right now you see it's set to star, which is a wild card that means give me all the channels. And there's two ways you could select channels. What I could do is I could click in here delete the star, type TX space TY, 
and then I would have those two channels. You can see we lost the click channel from here. Another option I could do is let me set it back to what it was, which is the star. I could use this little drop down here on the right side, which when I click on it, you'll see it, it shows me all the channels available in the little drop down, and clicking on each one will automatically write its name into that channel name parameter. And that effectively gives us the same end result, but depending on, you know, maybe if you have a ton of channels, you don't know exactly which ones you want, you can click the drop down and kind of just look through all the channels. So we'll do the same thing. We'll make another select chop to isolate our click channel. So I'll go to the channel names, click the drop down, click click. So now I have my click separated and my position separated. So before we do any more processing, let's find out where these values need to go. So what I'm going to do is inside of this over, this over top, we talked about using the translates. We used them a little bit in the last example. Essentially what I can do is find a way to get that X position translate to be controlling this X position translate. We want the Y position of the mouse to control this Y position translate. And then for our click, what we're going to do is go to our level top and level top has many different pages, but what a lot of people use level for is just simple opacity, which you'll find on the post page parameter. And then we're just going to turn this opacity on and off every time it clicks. So if you click, it'll pulse it and we'll make a nice little ADSR, which is basically like an envelope or a shape to the click. So it's not just a straight on, off, on, off. It'll have a little bit of shape to it. And we'll assign that click channel to this opacity. So first let's just start with our position. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to we select all of my chops by right clicking and dragging. I'm just going to move them over a little bit to the left so I have some room to work. I'm going to set up a null. And like we said before, null chops are extremely important and we'll see exactly why in this case. Because let's pretend we're in a situation and it's not really even pretend because in my mind, I don't know what value ranges I need for these. I don't know if it needs to be smooth. I don't really know, but I want to start just getting the network working so that I can start getting feedback from the actual network and then I can adjust the network as needed. Now, if, like I said before, if we did something like reference our channels from here and then we add something after, we have to redo the references. And if we added another operator after, we have to redo them again. But we wanna just save ourselves all that trouble and we know the checkpoint of this little chain of operators here is going to be a fully processed TX and TY position that are gonna be ready to reference in that parameter. So for that reason, I'm going to even make my null chop right now before I even get to the end of the programming. And then what I can do is even set up the reference now and just see what happens, see what it looks like. Now referencing is one of the most fundamental parts of touch designer programming because especially with chops being our control data, they're the easiest way for beginners to basically just take control data and assign them to parameters. So in this case, we already talked about how we want to change the over TX and TY to be referenced by these TX and TY channels. So to do so is really simple. What I want to do is click on my over so that I see its parameters. Then I can go to my null chop here, click on the plus to activate its viewer. And then what you'll see is once my mouse is inside of here, I can actually highlight the channels themselves and then essentially just click and drag and drop them. It's, it's as simple as that. So if I wanted to take this TX channel, I can just highlight over it, click, drag, you'll see I now have this little arrow as I'm dragging. I'll bring it over to the translate X parameter, release it. And then I get this little pop-up box that gives me a couple of default options for referencing. Without getting too far into it, the only one you need to know when you're starting is the second one. 95% of the time you're going to be using the second one. Maybe in a slim case, you'll use the first one. But if you're going to use the first one, you should watch our optimization video first, because that's the only place where that's really useful. Otherwise, you're always going to use the second one. And what happens is when you click this second one, you'll see that there's a dotted line with an arrow that kind of points towards the overtop from the null two. And we can see that arrow is animated. It is similar exactly what we were saying to how when we have data inside of our operators that are dynamic and updating, it's going to change the animation of the wire. And this gives us the same thing. This shows us that there's dynamic data passing from this null to this over. And what you can see now, even without, you know, really getting too much into the weeds of what's going on, we're now able to control the position of that circle using our mouse left and right position. Now we haven't mapped our TY position. That's why it doesn't do anything. 
So let's go ahead and do the same thing. We'll go over to our null. We make sure that our over top is selected. So that way we see its parameters and then we can drag and drop this ty value onto the y parameter. And then like I said, second option. Now you can see ty works, tx works, but like we we're saying, I think the scaling is a little too far. And the reason for that is right now our units are set to fraction and the fraction, because we're justified horizontally in the center and vertically in the center means that zero, zero is going to be our center. And then what happens is we're going to go all the way to the left and we can watch the value and see when it reaches the edge. We can see that 0.5 is going to be the left edge. When we have a negative 0.5 on our X, we are going to be centered on the left edge with our circle. And similarly, if we go and check the other side, we can see that 0.5 on the positive on our TX is going to be our circle being centered on the right edge. So let's see if, if Y is similar. So if I go up to the top here, I'll see centering my circle center on the top will give me a positive 0.5. And if I go downwards to the bottom edge, I'll have negative 0.5. So what I need to do now, which is very common in chops, is scaling my values. I need to take a range, which I have now, and we can see here is negative one to one left and right. And similarly, it's negative one bottom to positive one top. And I need to scale those to be negative 0.5 to positive 0.5 in both directions. Now, luckily, this is really easy in Touch Designer, and we're going to use another operator that is probably going to be one of your most used operators. It's going to be a math chop. So what I'll do is I'll go in between my select and my null. And this is exactly why we set up the null, because now I can just keep inserting further processing inside without having to then re-drag and drop this whole shenanigans every time I change something. So I can easily just go in between, right-click on the wire, insert operator, type math, pick that one out. And then math has a lot of different options, but what we want is range. And what you'll see is the default is zero to one in our from range and zero to one in our to range. So we know that our, our from range is actually not zero to one. We know it's negative one to one. So if I change this bottom value to negative one, you'll see now my from range of negative one to one and my two range being zero to one, if we compare the values from our select with the values in our math, we'll see now when we have a TX of negative one, in our math, it's actually zero. Now we know that we don't want it to be zero. We actually want it to be negative 0.5. So now we'll see that on the left edge, when we hit the left edge of the screen, we get our circle centered on the left edge. Now on the right side, we're still going too far because we're still going to one instead of positive 0.5. So let's also change that to be positive 0.5. And now you see, as I move my TX from the left to the right, it stays within the boundaries of my canvas. We're not getting the circle escaping. And you can customize this to whatever you want. Like for instance, if you only wanted your circle to ever reach a max and like maybe bump the edge, we would just look at what the value is and we can see inside of our select here, that would actually be a value of, uh, well, actually what we should do is look at our over here and see where that value is. We want it to stop at zero, negative 0 0.44 and then probably it's going to be positive 0 0.44. So then if I go back to my math, I could change my two range to be negative 0 0.44 and positive 0.44. Now, instead of having the left edge of our screen and the right edge of our screen being the circle center, it's actually just you know getting close to the edge. Maybe not exact, you probably wanna measure it a little bit better, but you can see how easy it is to now start iterating now that we have that visual feedback. So what I'm gonna do is set this back to be negative 0.5 and positive 0.5 for my two range. And you can see if we test it on the Y range as well, everything works as expected because both of those were doing a negative one to one range and now they've been rearranged. So now let's, let's take that same concept and do it with our click. So what I'm going to do first is make a null chop. I'm going to connect my click channel to it from the select. 
Then I'm going to go to my level, go to the post page of the parameters, to the opacity. And just like we did before, with my level selected, I'm going to activate the viewer on my null, and then click and drag my click channel to the opacity, let it go, choose the second option. Once you do this referencing, you can actually turn the viewer off on each one of these. And you'll see what's happening now is my click is zero when off and one when it's down. So every time I click, my circle becomes visible. But like I said, we want to do something a little bit more interesting than that. So I want to introduce you to another operator, which is called lag. And what lag does is it allows us to filter the data a little bit. And what that means is it just allows us to average the data over time. So what I'm going to do is similarly, I'm going to right click on this wire, insert operator, type lag, pick that one. And you can already see it's doing something interesting. Well, a little bit more interesting, but it's already doing something. Now, if we look at the parameters of the lag, we'll see that the lag is set to 0 0.2 and 0 0.2. And if we look at the units, it's set to seconds. And what that means is when we click, it's going to take 0 0.2 seconds from the value to go from 0 to 1. And when we let go, it's also going to take 0 0.2 seconds to go down. Now, for my personal preference, I think it would be more interesting if we had it go instantly from you know, 0 to 1 but then to have a really longer trail off. So what I would do then in that case is go to my lag parameters, set my upwards lag to be zero. So now it turns on instantly, but it fades away. And then what I would do is go to my downward lag and say maybe set it to one second. So now I click and it essentially has a one second fade out before that channel kind of goes back to zero. So now, you can do this however you want. Maybe you want it to actually be inverted. Maybe you want the con this little circle to always be on, but then the click to change it from being on to being off. So what we could do is we could also add another math chop after our leg. So I'll right click on the wire, insert operator, type math. And math has a really useful function because what we can do is we can basically invert the range here. So right now we go from zero to one, and then back to zero. I'll go to my two range. So we know my from range is from zero to one, but I'll set my two range to be from one to zero. And essentially what this does is it basically inverts our kind of uh, our channel here. So that means it's always going to be one when it's off. We click it down, it instantly goes to black. And then when I let go, it takes one second to fade back on. So just like this, you can really quickly and easily start using any of the different chops. I mean, what's really important to understand is the concepts that we're learning are applicable to anything. So if I brought in a different chop here, maybe like a DMX in, or maybe audio or black tracks, OSC, anything we brought in would have the same fundamentals. We would take some data. We would use some select chops to isolate different parts of it. We would compute them or process them a little bit, maybe using math chops, lag chops, uh, filter chops, any other chop that we want to filter with. Then we would go to a null chop, which would be our checkpoint, from which point we can use the viewer active to click and drag those values and directly take over different parameters. And you can do this with any parameter. So you know we could take something like even another simple example is take a movie file in top. I'm going to change the file to be count.mov just so we have a video. And I could do something as easy as, you know, let's say I want to take the speed of this movie and have it be changed by the, the X position of the mouse on the screen. So what I would do here is maybe go back to where I have this select. I can make another math chop because I want to scale it differently than how I had scaled it here previously for my uh, circle position. So I can grab this select, drag another wire to my new math. And now I can think, okay, well, I want to rearrange and I know it's negative one to one. So I'm going to set my from range from negative one to one. But now I want it to actually be a range of zero to one because I want the speed to be zero and I want the max speed to be one, let's say for our example. So what I would do is make another null chop, go to my movie, now I can see its parameters, open up my viewer, turn it, make it active on the null chop, 
and I can just drag and drop my TX, drop it on speed, click the second option, relative chop reference, and now you can see in real time, within 10 seconds, I can control the speed of this movie with the position of my mouse. And because like I'm saying again, these fundamentals are universal, we could delete the mouse in, put a connect chop, and then just select the hand channels. And then you can use the hand channels to control the circle or the movie playback. It's all the same fundamentals. So now that we've gotten a little bit of a better handle on chops and we've looked at tops, let's move on and check out our next operator family.